qualified to be sworn in as an Anderson City firefighter. Bobby, if you will, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I. I, Bobby Warden. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To do my duty. To do my duty. As an Anderson firefighter. As an Anderson firefighter. To serve my commanding officers. To serve my commanding officers. With respect and dignity. With respect and dignity. To serve and protect the citizens of the city of Anderson. To serve and protect the citizens of Anderson. With compassion, courage, and integrity. With compassion, courage, and integrity. And to uphold the laws, rules, and regulations. To uphold the laws, rules, and regulations. Of the United States of America. Of the United States of America. The state of South Carolina. The state of South Carolina. And the city of Anderson. And the city of Anderson. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thanks, Chief. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Congratulations. Congratulations, Bob. Congratulations. Welcome aboard. Thanks. Thank you for your service. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. A proclamation that we would. Um, like to present to the public and I'm gonna ask Erica Kraft to come up Good. Good. I read the proclamation and the proclamation reads whereas the week of March 28th through April the 2nd 2016 has been designated as National Community <coughs> Development Week by the National <coughs> Community Development Association to celebrate the Community Development Block Grant, better known as CDBG program, and the Home Investment Partnership, the Home Program. And whereas the CDBG program provides annual funding and flexibility to local communities to provide decent, safe, and affordable housing, a suitable living environment, and economic opportunities to low and moderate income individuals. And whereas the home program provides funding to local communities to create decent, safe, and affordable housing opportunities for low-income persons, nationally over 1 million units of affordable housing have been completed using home funds. And whereas over the past five years, our community has received a total a little over almost $3 million in CDBG money, and over almost $600,000 in home funds as a member of the Anderson County Home Consortium. And whereas the following activities have been funded, over owner-occupied housing rehabilitation assistance, home ownership assistance to first-time home buyers, public service including the promotion of fair housing, in addition to economic development by providing loans to small businesses and micro enterprises. Now, therefore, it be resolved that the city of Anderson designates the week of March 28th through April the 2nd, 2016 as National Community Development Week in support of these two valuable programs that have made tremendous contributions to the viability of the housing stock, the infrastructure, public service, and economic vitality to our community be it further resolved that our community urges Congress and the administration to recognize the outstanding work being done locally and nationally by CDBG and home by supporting increased funding for both programs in the fiscal year 2017, signed this 14th day of March 2016. And Eric, I'd like for you to say a few words if you would. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I'd like to invite everyone from the community to come out on March the 29th, uh, 12 o'clock until 2 o'clock p.m. We will be hosting our annual celebration. It will be held at the Municipal Business Center that's at 601 South Main Street, and we will be in the first floor conference room. We'll have staff available to speak about our housing assistance programs. We'll also uh, showcase some of the projects that we've implemented during the past year, and we will have uh, refreshments. So hopefully you all can join us. Thank you.
The minutes of our February 22nd meeting have been distributed. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? Make a motion that we accept them as presented. Uh, first by Mr. Stewart, second by Mr. Buck Roberts. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The minutes of February 22nd pass unanimously. We don't have any old business. We'll move directly to our one item of new business, and that new business is a request consideration of medical contract for the detention center. Ms. McCall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this request, as you all know, we are in the detention center business. Uh, we house both male and female detainees in our uh, jail, in our detention facility. We also service uh, the United States Marshal Service and the Bureau of Prisons. And we have an average daily population in our jail of about 110 um, inmates in that facility. Um, certainly part of our business and being in the det detention center business is the provision of medical care to our detainees. And that means for everybody who comes in the door, there's an initial screening. We dispense medications. We deal with acute care, whatever those medical uh, needs are with a physician available 24-7. Uh, we currently provide these services with our city staff. And the reason for bringing this to you tonight is that we began being aware that we had uh, some staffing changes that were on the horizon and we wanted to look and see what kind of options were out there for uh, providing medical care in a turnkey operation and as always anytime you look to change the way that you do business you look at opportunities to do that in a an improved fashion um, so in anticipation of those staffing changes, we advertised for and accepted requests for proposals from uh, people in the industry who provide that type of comprehensive health care service. The only respondent that we had was Southern Health Partners, and we did reach out certainly to our local um, regional health facility in ANMED to see if they had um, an interest in providing that type of um, service delivery for our detention center. They felt like that because it was a very specialized type of medical care, uh, they um, said thank you, but at this time they were not um, interested in um, responding to our request. Just so you know a little bit about Southern Health Partners, they do provide um, detention medical services. They do this for more than 200 cities and counties um, across 13 different states. Um, they are in this specialty business as far as detention centers. If you'll notice in your summary, they provide these services. This is just a few of them kind of in our neck of the woods. Anderson County, Greenwood County, Beaufort County, Newberry County, Abbeville County, Aiken and Lawrence counties, Pickens County, and, and more. Um, it, we are a little bit of an anomaly um, in this state in that most um, detention facilities are more likely found to be uh, county operated as opposed to uh, cities. That's why you see so many counties listed in their um, provision of services. Um, as it states, SHP would be in, as far as their proposal, they'd be responsible for all medical care for the inmates, and that includes the purchase of medications. Currently, we purchase those medications. That's at our cost uh, with our staff, but this would be a change that would put that responsibility on the provider, not just for the medical care, but also the um, purchase of those medications as, as well. That medical care begins when an, an inmate comes into our custody and it ends when obviously in, uh, the discharge. Uh, if there's a need to transport someone to some other um, medical facility for care, that would be included as well. Um, the contract amount is $137,979.96. It is for a one-year period. 
if it was approved that tonight the um, start date of that contract would be April the 15th. The um, opportunity to extend that for a second and third year is certainly um, out there and would be available to us. There's also a provision in the contract for uh, 60 days notice to either by either party to get out of the, the contract. And as we stated, the benefit, we believe, certainly rests in the fact that this is a turnkey operation and there are uh, funding for the contract would be out of the detention budget. So in summary, the reason for going in this direction is we do believe that there's some cost savings to be incurred by the purchase of med medications being through SHP as opposed to our doing it on our own. Uh, we think that certainly the uh, risk um, is reduced because that transfers to Southern Health Partners. And it, we think there's the opportunity for um, a level of care as far as the delivery of health care that can truly be customized to our needs and would provide for some future efficiencies and effectiveness. I think it, uh, one additional thing is that um, Southern Health Partners, in terms of their staffing and the work that they do, they have a law enforcement background and or jail administration that they bring to the table. So it's not just being in the business of medical care or being health care professionals. They're specialized in uh, detention um, care, medical care for detention facilities. Um, we have with us tonight Chief Jim Stewart as well as Chris Hudson representing um, Southern Health Partners if you have specific questions that um, you'd like for them to address. Thank you. Um, any comments, questions? Ms. Stewart? Uh, <clears throat> I know you mentioned that there may be a, a, a savings, uh, but I think when we spoke, I think last year it was like, a, you said 110,000 roughly was for salaries and we spent about 5,000 for on medications last year. So roughly that's about 115 and their contract is 137 which means actually it's an increase not a savings to what we're currently providing right now that would be my first observation and then the second thing would be is um, when do we anticipate the current staff on leaving did they have they already put in a 30 60 day notice or they're working with us do we have any our current nurse practitioner is seeking his MD license so he's let us know that he would like to be relieved of those services but out of respect for the continuity of care and um, because of our working relationship he knows that we're pursuing this as an option for health care so no we do not have a date on that yet um, we and, and then also, um, again, I know there's a lot of counties on here. I know that we may be out there by ourselves as a city. There's not too many cities that does jails, but there are cities out there that do jails. And I would just be curious of what, who are those cities, those, those municipalities are using. And then like who is Greenville County using? They're, they're right, our next door neighbor, and they're not even on this list. And um, and I know we, we mentioned out, we haven't even reached out to Greenville Hospital System, but we did reach out to AnMed, but AnMed, even like in their emergency room, they don't use AnMed doctors anymore. They use a, they use a group of consultants called 24 on Physicians, which is a bunch of um, uh, nurse practitioners and medical assistants, and so didn't know if we've even reached out to that private group as well, you know, who are providing private services for ANMED. So there's a lot of questions, you know, that I have, and I'm just not comfortable with the way that it's presented tonight. And, you know, I would just ask that, you know, and I'll defer to my fellow council members, but I would just ask if we could do a little bit more research and maybe bring it back in two weeks. Well, 
I appreciate that. And I would tell you, it, in terms of trying to seek out those who are in the business of providing this, that is what we advertise for with our request for proposals. And, and as I stated, we only got one respondent for that um, RFP. So I think we certainly are trying to find others who provide this type of specialized service, but we can certainly. Um, but we did reach out to ANMED because they didn't put in our proposal. And I'm like, there's others that we just chose not to reach out to. And I'm just, you know, because Greenville Hospital System, they're here in Anderson. They're operating here now. And so they're almost local. A lot of doctors that you go to, they're under GHS system. And uh, so. Can we, um, and, and we'll, we'll obviously um, consider that and we we'll ask counsel. I, I just, since we have um, a representative from Southern Health Partners here tonight, um, could you talk to us maybe about the municipality representation that you have through your company or chief or whoever I don't know chief you might know you might want to I would tee just speak off. to one thing uh, mayor and council uh, we are very unique here in the city of Anderson where we run a detention center <clears throat> we, we operate the federal detention center and that is out of five agencies in this state that run that between Rock Hill, Lexington, Charleston, um, the city. That places us in somewhat, and um, Mr. Hudson will be able to tell you, as he was uh, president of our jail administrators association at one time, the city of Anderson Detention Center is larger than some of the county jails in this state. And, and that is the reason we've always played such a big um, part in the jail administrator, administrator association. I was looking um, while Ms. McConnell was talking, and there are actually 26 detention centers that this company runs. And I'll let Mr. Hudson speak in regards to that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have. Uh, in reference to, um, you, you got Rock Hill City Police Department. Um, they're limited on holding, holding time. Merlot Beach PD, uh, they're very limited. There's a 48-hour holding uh, facility. Uh, most cities that run jails are just a 24 or 48 hour just because of standard. Anderson City is very unique in the fact that it does hold continuously 365 days a year based on um, pretrial and sentenced and federal. Uh, we do run, uh, we, we actually have um, 26, 28 actual sites uh, right now here in South Carolina. We run 220 plus sites across 13 states. Um, we have some cities and, and of course, definitely counties and other states. Um, so, you know, it is definitely unique, uh, Mr. Stewart, there's no doubt. Um, a lot of times the local hospital doesn't want to get involved, uh, but one is because of its inmates. They're afraid for whatever uh, reason uh, they don't want, like to deal with inmates. We try to meet with and have met with the Sheriff's Association, the Hospital Association, to try to bring that bridge together um, in order to help alleviate some issues there at ER as well uh, because of that fact. Uh, they just don't want them there. They don't like to, uh, and some of the malpractice uh, liability insurance, some of the doctors do not carry, and they don't want to place that liability on themselves. Um, so the uh, additional cost savings that you're going to see is the city will, if you are currently paying for um, any kind of benefit package, then that benefit package you would not have to continue to pay. That would fall back to us as since we're actually employing the uh, nurses and so forth. Does that help any? But you're not employing our nurses, though. We're, we're not because they're, they're CMAs. Right. You know, not... You know, and I, I see your price here, but I would just be curious, you know, from our, you know, staff standpoint, what would it, you know, what would it cost to hire another nurse practitioner and a certified medical assistant? Because a uh, certified medical assistant, they can dispense medication and uh, give shots and everything else. And that's essentially what you're basically getting here is an RN and a two hour from a nurse practitioner, two hour a week. You know, which that's eight hours a month. You know, it's not a whole lot of time. I guess that's a good point. And now, 
and and obviously those things need to be. And Mr. Stewart wants that information, and it probably we probably need to find it out. My interest here tonight is that since we are seeking information, and we we we, we do have the, and that's a good question, but uh, we do have a representative here. Are there any more questions toward Mr. Harvey? I'm not sure if it's towards him. Do you want me to wait? No, go right here. Okay. No. I mean, um, just a couple quick things. Um, the request for proposals, mm -hmm. and <coughs> we sent that out and only received one back. Mm -hmm. And then we went and did a little bit of <coughs> calling AMED and some other people to see. Is that normal when we do RFQs? Do I, we, it, don't we just open the RFQ and what we get? Do we ever go shop it? But before we before we put the RFP out, we reached out to ANMED just out of courtesy, since since they are here to see if and because we have a nurse practitioner on in our municipal business center for our employees, but that was just a courtesy prior to the RFPs to <coughs> see if there was interest there. Um, so I, I think to answer your question, Mr. Harbin, the most common thing is certainly for us to put it out to the public and see who we get. We, it, it's not unusual for us if we know others are in that business to make sure they know about the RFP. And we really, the only people we know for sure is AMED wasn't interested in it and nobody else ref well, came back from the RFP. Yes, sir, but remember, too, in, in making a change, what we're not just looking for simply the provision of medical care. We're looking for a turnkey operation that takes that medical care in a different direction, principally taking that, the responsibility for all of that medical care off of our staff and putting it with, lodging it with a, a, a provider who is truly in the business of detention center medical care. So I think that's kind of the difference as opposed to it being, yes, there are plenty of health care providers out there. Who are the providers that are in the um, health care industry for detention centers? And um, I had an opportunity um, to, um, to, when I saw the agenda to speak with the nurse practitioner that we've currently had, I didn't realize he's been here for a considerable number of years. Yes, correct. I mean, do you know how many years? Chief does. I, I can't recall it off the top of my head, at least 10 to 15. I mean, I thought, I was thinking he told me he'd been here like 20 years, and I was like, I didn't even know that. He's been here a long he, time. He was here. I guess the compound that, and so I had, I had a discussion with him, and you know, he was very positive toward the direction that we're moving in. Uh, but. You know, secondly, I didn't realize he came in every morning and, you know, did all these things. And he did it. To me, it was very economical. I'm not sure you could hire somebody else to do what he did. <laughs> for the price. For the price, for all the days that he did it. I'm not sure I would be interested in, <laughs> in doing it. Um, and, and so I guess that gets to the second question of um, the 24-7 availability what happens today if you don't mind me asking that on what happens today if something happens that do we just take them to the emergency room or and, and then what will happen april 16th if we were to employ this company if we need someone needed medical assistant after the doctor left that was only there an hour or two in the yes. morning does that make sense yes if, if I'll answer your question first, um, what, what you asked, uh, Ms. McConnell, this wasn't something that we just looked at. Uh, Captain Carpenter and I have been investigating this um, pretty much uh, from December 2014. Did, did you talk to the, the guy that we've employed? He, it seemed like he had, had a, been having conversations with you for quite, or with Mr. Carpenter for quite some time about going in this direction. Is that right, and, and that is why we found ourselves in this position. I didn't think we could afford this package maybe two years ago. And now we find ourselves with um, Mr. Dorn is fixing to become a medical doctor, and and the basic is is what Ms. McConnell said. He's ready to resign. He's ready to move on to the next step in his career. We also have a uh, medical assistant open right now, so we have just one medical assistant and our nurse practitioner in the morning, uh, and it, it puts us in that position where we're looking, we're wanting to expand. Um, this um, system is much like uh, what. 
our ABL food management does with the prisoners in the back. Uh, there's a total turnkey operation with the uh, dietary standards and making sure they're up to um, that level. Uh, the proposal, uh, we did look at it to begin with. Um, we brought it to the administration. Um, we did reach out to ANMED, I think, again, that they were not interested because it is a prison-type setting um, when you're dealing with the federal prisoners upstairs. Um, they were just not totally comfortable with that. And um, what, what you're looking for is a medical business that is routed toward handling um, prisoners in a most efficient manner. And as you, you uh, answered there, Mr. Stewart, there is a slight increase. But um, within the money that is in our uh, professional supplies, budget, professional services, um, there's a little extra money. Plus, I think it would be a cost-saving to us for not having to go to the emergency room quite so often uh, when we have to find emergencies. Um, oftentimes, there's times that uh, Mr. Dorn is not available before us. We can either reach out to our um, brother agency at Anderson County Sheriff's Office and see what they can do to assist us. Um, or we go straight to the ER and it takes officers off the road for many hours while we're up there sitting with the prisoner. Uh, the benefit of Southern Health Partners is they're already at Anderson County um, should we have an immediate emergency. And um, what Mr. Hudson spoke to and he, he might allude more to is that the people that are in Anderson County could just come straight over to our jail then since we're all in the same business with them. So would it be safe to say that the uh, person incarcerated would get better service with this particular I think when you have an LPN at the minimum in the jail here versus a medical assistant you would get a lot more quality of care you okay yes Mr. Stewart uh, in all due respect chief um, and I, I was I sat on the public safety committee when we brought in a ABL the food service provider and you know, it went before the Public Safety Committee, and we went and we researched, we asked all the questions, and then we brought it back before council. You know, if we've known about this since December 2014, we've had numerous Public Safety Committee meetings since then. It has yet been talked about. You know, if we knew it was on the horizon, it has not been brought before any member of the Public Safety Committee. A lot of these questions could have probably been answered in the Public Safety Committee beforehand, but it seemed like we're just jumping into this and moving forward. You know, I know we talk about um, <clears throat> taking the responsibility off of the city staff. Well, I, I don't see this as any more different than taking the responsibility off the city staff as we'd have our nurse practitioner across the street seeing our 452 city employees that go over there and see her every day with that medical assistance. You know, that'd be like saying we're going to yank the rug out from under her and bring somebody else in to provide those services because they're city staff. You know, so... Um, Why don't we take a step back here? Okay. And... Um, we all have additional questions, and I, I think we can look at some numbers. Um, appreciate you being here today, Mr. Hudson, but uh, I think if, if I don't hear anything, I think we would prefer to just defer this decision for two weeks and, and, and maybe during that point in time try to have a public safety committee meeting or at least get these questions to Ms. McConnell so we can have them answered on the floor um, next meeting. Is that okay with everybody? Good. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Administrative briefing, Ms. McCall. Well, we have some uh, good news to report to you about our new venture into ice skating. And as you know, uh, we've embarked on an um, opportunity to ex increase our recreational opportunities, provide more exposure to our city as a whole, uh, opportunity for increased hospitality revenues and increased business potential for our downtown businesses. Um, we, when we first brought this idea forward, uh, we, I don't think we anticipated Number one, that it would be quite as popular as it was. Number two, that it took as much um, time, effort, and um, Bobby will shoot me for saying this, but uh, it was a fun venture for us in a lot of ways, and we learned a lot through that um, eight weeks of, of ice skating. Now, we didn't just spend eight weeks ice skating. We spent a lot of time in getting that 
facility ready and certainly when we purchased the ice rink it was a turnkey operation <clears throat> so as we talk about the expenditures and the revenues uh, the acquisition cost were 71,000 that bought the ice rink the fencing the matting 150 pair of skates the skate sharpener and all of the original supplies to install and operate it. It also included the building which we sell tickets out of and have the skates in and it included our lighting. So the majority of those expenses certainly were one-time expenses that we will not have to spend this uh, next season. With regard to our staffing cost, we had certainly the those who staffed the rink itself and as well as our security and that was 42,000. Um, I have to say a real special thanks to those people who were on our special events team. Those are city employees, 23 of them, who helped staff that. They came from all across our city divisions, so we had a, a good representation, and it was, it was um, a real good opportunity for all of us. Our skating revenues, while they amounted to 26500 we also got revenues from city and county uh, accommodation tax in the form of $3,000 from the city and $1,500 from the county. And I can't say enough about the hospitality revenue. We were able to look at the nine restaurants downtown for looking at their gross sales and comparing the 14, 2014 sales revenue with the 2015 gross sales revenue, and we saw an increase in more than $311,000. So I think in terms of the original um, opportunities, positive opportunities that this project set in motion, I think it's very fair to say that we um, met our um, initial goals for what we were trying to achieve. We, we did operate um, eight weeks, November the 20th through January the 18th. I think we had eight days that uh, rain caused us to be closed. But the most amazing thing, I think, to all of us, um, and we, we put something at your desk that gives a detail of where these participants came from, but we had almost 7,000 people come and participate in skating uh, during those eight weeks. They represented 32 states, two foreign countries, and the thing that we heard over and over again, um, we had 2,667 participants that were under the age of 12. What we heard over and over again was thank you, City, for providing uh, an opportunity that was a new activity, it was a family activity, and it met a, an age group niche that we're, we don't seem to be meeting, and th this actually did fit the bill. And as you can tell from your detail of those participants, the, um, the places that they came from is mind-boggling. Uh, sometimes you wonder how somebody from Lincoln, Nebraska ends up at our, our skating rink, but it's kind of an awesome uh, report. So I think we would tell you that from your staff standpoint, we considered it to be um, uh, uh, a very well received new activity. Um, this the numbers don't account for the people who came to our city and perhaps purchased a meal somewhere other than downtown. So we we certainly have not captured every bit of information that we could from those participants. But I think this gives you a, a good feeling as to um, were your dollars spent in a positive fashion in a way that met our needs and we would tell you that it did. I would also tell you that our hospitality revenue is up overall so we're tracking um, we expect our revenues to be 2.4 million total uh, for this current fiscal year and I think we're off to a really great start. Um, if I left something out or if you have some additional questions Bobby Bevel is here this evening and um, um, while he was glad that those eight weeks were over, because he staffed it himself an awful lot, 
Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you that we have already met, our, the staff has met, and we had a lot of observations from this season that I think will serve us well in terms of knowing how to um, meet the needs of our participants and do things better and more efficiently and differently and so forth. So um, we're still in that process, but we're grateful for the opportunity to have added this to our um, mix. Very good. Um, we also want to share with you tonight um, another exciting thing that we think was um, a new offering of ours. As you know, we have an economic development division that continues to add um, new opportunities and those things that are good for entre entrepreneurship in our city. And um, eSpark Boot Camp is a startup business accelerator and a, a program for those entrepreneurs. And we have um, Glenn Breed, who's going to tell you a little bit about that. I know you know, but it doesn't hurt to remind you of where we've come from in terms of offering this new program. And we also have a special guest who's going to tell us a little bit about his participation in eSpark Boot Camp. So, Glenn. Thank you, Ms. McConnell. I appreciate it. Um, Mayor and Council, we'd really like to thank you all for your continued support in our uh, programs and our division and your investment in the business community. Um, just, to, just to refresh, refresh you on the, the boot camp, um, it is an eight-week eight program that's focused on business concepts for entrepreneurs. Um, it, is, uh, it is focused on um, teaching uh, entrepreneurship from from business concept to basically storefront you hope to to uh, to get to that point uh, for our participants just to just to remind you also we started this in the summer of 2015 uh, at that time we had five participants in the program uh, the the uh, the focus sectors were IT education healthcare, culinary culinary arts and, and uh, we also had some, some uh, participation in a fitness program. In the fall of, uh, of this year, we just completed our boot camp for 2016. Um, we made some changes, uh, kind of critiqued what, what we did the first session, made some changes, um, and developed a partnership uh, with SBDC um, and Ben Smith, who directs that, that operation, the Small Business Development Council operation. Um, and he is also a certified uh, next level curriculum uh, instructor, which is an entrepreneurial program uh, that he, he is certified in. Um, and what we did, we also expanded um, from, uh, from new startups to existing business. We wanted to, to offer this to, uh, to new, biz uh, new businesses and existing businesses that, uh, that needed some training or needed to, to go through the program. Uh, to learn some uh, from uh, some successes that yielded 16 participants um, in this fall program so we went from five participants to to 16 per participants uh, in the fields of automotive uh, wellness and exercise metal fabrication IT art framing finance education some of the existing businesses uh, were property management and landscaping uh, commercial real estate a gourmet ki kitchen retailer, which y'all probably know who that is. Um, what uh, what we wanted to do was to allow others to take advantage of this this great program that that we we feel is a benefit to our our business community. Um, our next boot camp will start up in September. It'll run from September uh, through November 21st, I believe it is. Um, anyone interested in in that program can certainly call my office. Um, or visit the downtown website. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, the, the hard workers for that put this program together in Arlene Young and Mary Haley Thompson. They've done a yeoman's job in, in pulling this off and, and improving the program, uh, which is important to us. As uh, Ms. McConnell mentioned, we're uh, delighted to have a, a guest to tonight that uh, participated in uh, the program that just finished up. His name is Vincent Baker. Uh, he's an aspiring entrepreneur and has accomplished a lot at such an, a young age of 23. 
Uh, Vincent won a high school business competition and was nominated Student Entrepreneur of the Year for 2012 by Yes Carolina. He's uh, a, a, a recipient or, or a participant in a program called Yes Carolina, and that's an entrepreneurial program for youth. Since this award, he's judged the competition himself for the past three years and even speaks to senior classes on the topic of entrepreneurship. He's learned a lot through, over the past eight weeks through our program and is here tonight to share his story and experience from his perspective uh, on, of eSpark. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Vincent, and I'll be glad to address any questions afterwards. Hello. Well, I'm happy to be here. Um, as stated before, my name is Vincent Baker, and I was an entrepreneur that attended this program. If you don't mind, I'm going to pull out my phone for some notes. I promise I will not be on social media tweeting or anything. <laughs> so no worries about that. Uh, one second. As long as you aren't driving. <laughs> All right. Let's see. But, yeah, he, he really did a fantastic job uh, speaking about me. It really, uh, <laughs> really humbles me to hear that. Um, but, yeah, so... Um, as he stated, Arlene and Mary Haley and uh, Ben and everyone else associated with this program really has done a, a very good job uh, taking in people from all walks of life and different areas. We were all varying ages uh, with all very different interests, but we all have one common, we all have one thing in common deep down and it's that entrepreneurship spirit that we all share. It's that we all have this passion, which that we believe that through bringing our focus and what we're good at and what we're best at is not only the best for ourselves but in return is best for everyone else around us uh, so with that being said uh, some background in my entrepreneurship uh, it actually started in high school where i took an entrepreneurship class uh, not because i was interested in entrepreneurship but because i liked the teacher because i had her in a previous class uh, when i was in there i was thinking i don't really care about being uh, dressed nice or you know all that stuff uh, didn't really make any sense to me and i just wanted to sell candy and make some extra cash on the side uh, my teacher though she she knew that i was really artistic she knew that i enjoyed writing and being creative and so she said vincent i'm not letting you sell candy she let other people sell candy, but she wouldn't let me sell candy. Um, and at first, I was kind of thrown off by that. But I didn't know at the time that entre oh, my bad. <laughs> I didn't know at the time that entrepreneurship meant. I didn't know how how far it stretched. You know, I thought that it was all about, you know, um, just like I thought it was just one particular path. But entrepreneurship is about finding what you enjoy and finding a way to making a lifestyle around that and have it benefit others. And through learning that, um, I grew greatly uh, through her class. And as he stated, I was selected as uh, Entrepreneur of the Year, or Student Entrepreneur of the Year by Yes Carolina. I was nominated. I also went on to win the business competition for that year and was brought back uh, consecutively as a guest to help mentor the students, um, which I think helped because they could sort of relate to me uh, with our similar ages. Um, with that, uh, going forward, I had taken my game. Uh, by the way, my name is Vincent Baker, and I am the creator of Vindicated Studios, where we make, uh, we make tabletop games that are unique to deliver an exceptional experience to people. So I'm involved in the entertainment industry. Um, with that, um, I have gone to several conventions. I've gone to several events running these games uh, to the public. Um, and basically entertaining other kids that are about 18 to 30 years old, mostly, more, more so around my age. Um, let's see. So with that, uh, fast forward, um, the program I actually found out, thanks to my dad, uh, I didn't actually know about it until he pointed it out. And whenever he did, he said, look, this would be really good for you. Uh, it makes sense with you know what I was into and what I was doing. And as soon as he showed it to me, I jumped right on it. I emailed uh, Arlene. And luckily, she responded to me, and she was happy to have me. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. I, I went into it uh, nervous. <laughs> um, but luckily, I, I really enjoyed it. And um, it was it's very much a learning experience because being an entrepreneur, we spend a lot of time uh, sort of sitting uh, amongst ourselves and working on our projects for hours and we were kind of 
it's kind of like this weird dynamic where we have to be reclusive and we have to be okay with not speaking to others for multiple you know hours at a time and then we have to be okay with speaking in front of a lot of people <laughs> and it's, it's this weird like introvert extrovert thing that uh, that I know I have and I think other people have too that, that shares my entrepreneurship um, you know passion so uh, with that uh, because of the initiative taken by the city of Anderson because of what you have allowed and because of the people that put together eSpark and, and Next Level and everyone's collaborative efforts um, I feel like everyone even though we've all come from the different walks of life we've all learned something and came out stronger than we were before um, we've all had something to learn and not only did we have something to learn but we, we also learned that it's we have each other to support on even though we come from these different backgrounds and we're these different people um, even since ever, ever since I've been enrolled in the program um, I've constantly been reached out to by various people involved in the program they've offered their their hands in helping me and I've offered my advice and insights on the, the few things I know uh, to, to help people um, and it's I, I think about succeeding in life is, is about a collaboration and, and helping each other out and I think that's the real way that we succeed I don't think it's about trying to put yourself so much uh, before others that you are trying to forget about the rest it's if you help them out they can help you out and we all build each other up that way um, so with my game uh, my game that I've been working on since high school is called other worlds it's a tabletop role-playing game which is basically a collaborative storytelling experience and you have someone that is the main facilitator uh, known as the world master and he gives you the scenarios and then you tell him what you want to do uh, in response so he may say that there's a child that's crying and he's saying you know that he misses his mom and what do you do and you keep responding to this and having this sort of experience for a tabletop game is drastic especially for people my age because there is there's been a steep incline in depression and anxiety disorders and social uh, social um, anxiety and just things that uh, because kids my age are so into video games and they're so into watching YouTube they're actually not in involved in interacting with people in real life the way they need to so a tabletop game which I specialize in and is what I'm making is what you do um, around the table and you get to meet people face to face you get to speak to people and it actually helps them come out of their shell it helps them uh, speak better it's helped me from personal experience and I know it's helped others from messages I've heard it's I've heard people say it's got them out of depression that it saved their life that they look forward to it every week um, you know whatever have you and so it's not just um, of course it's a you know I'm biased and it's a passion project of mine since it's been with me since my childhood but it, it is something that I feel like benefits uh, society as, as a whole especially for my age demographic um, so with that being said um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time to listen to me um, if you guys have any questions I'd be more than happy to answer them but I really do believe that this program has uh, been a wonderful opportunity for for not only myself but from what I've heard from my fellow peers um, it's really helped them out as well and we look forward to con continuously working together um, so thank you very much I'm, I'm very honored to be speaking here today thank you Vincent yeah. any questions for Vincent so with all you've learned and the things you've been through, what do you plan to go from here? What do I think of what? what do you, where do you plan to go from here? Okay, so where I plan to go from here is uh, my game's almost ready to, to launch. Uh, I've worked on it for long enough now, so I'm going, I'm going to be releasing my game this year, so I'm very excited about that. I'm going to continue speaking at events. I'm going to continue running games. I was actually just at, a, uh, at a, an event uh, this past Saturday, in which we had over 50 attendees and um, we could have had even more uh, we just need more staff but we kind of have the problem where there's more supply uh, or there's more demand than there is supply which is a good thing um, and so we're growing and I'm very excited about that and so I, I'm kind of working on that end to just sort of grow uh, what we can supply to meet to meet the demand and um, uh, yeah I'm just I, I plan on traveling and and hosting events places and and having it all you know, centered back here. So, any other questions?
Well, thank you, Vincent, and um, okay. appreciate the kind words of eSports. And um, we look to um, hear good things from you in the future. And when you really make your first billion dollars, you'll mention eSports <laughs> and City of Anderson. I will. I, I will not forget a single person. I, they will all be in the credits. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it, Vincent. All thank right, you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. Good thank luck. you. Yeah. Right, we got upcoming events. Upcoming events in your calendar. We have uh, the West Side Community Coalition meets tomorrow afternoon at 4. Um, seat 2 has their neighborhood watch meeting at 6 p.m. at the fire station 3. On Thursday, the Southeast Anderson Task Force meets at 5.30 at the Career Campus. <clears throat> Not on your calendar, but please mark it down. On Tuesday the 22nd is the Chamber's annual meeting. This is a special meeting um, in the sense that it will, they have a special speaker that night and this will be held at 6, from 6 p.m. to 8.30 in Death Valley at the West Zone Club. On Thursday we have the uh, Public Works Utilities Committee meeting, that's at noon. And also that evening at 5 p.m., the Concerned Citizens of the East Side at Hope Baptist Church. And then our community <coughs> development celebration uh, drop-in on the 29th that you heard Erica mention earlier this evening. That's all we have. You Thank Easter you. Easter on Easter Sunday on the 27th. Indeed. Early this yes. year. Also, before we adjourn, I'll... Um, on a, I see we have one of our city churches here, Bethel AME Church members there. So we appreciate you guys being here today, taking interest in our in our meeting. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So first by Mr. Buck Roberts, second by Mr. Lockridge. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? We'll stay adjourned. adjourn.